So welcome to This Cycling Life. Today, we're delighted to be joined by Simon Gerrans, uh, an entrepreneur and former professional cyclist. Simon doesn't need a big introduction, um, a long and very illustrious pro career in which he won Milan San Remo, Liège, Bastogne Liège. He took uh, victories in all three of the Grand Tours. He was a multiple um, Australian uh, champion. Uh, and also multiple winner of the Tour Down Under. So, Simon Gerrans, welcome to you, and it'd be great to get an update from how you're spending your time right now. Uh, thanks, Jamie. Well, firstly, thank you for having me. Um, it's, it, it's a pleasure to be here and, and, and great to chat with you guys. Um, what am I doing with my days now? So my, my current uh, role is um, the CEO of a business called The Service Course, which is a business that a former teammate of mine founded um, four or five years ago now. Uh, I came, became involved as an investor in the business um, about 18 months ago and, and, and have since been working within the business for the past 12 months. So uh, recently relocated to Australia, so sort of juggling a number of things with the move uh, here and a young family and, and settling back in Australia after, after being abroad for uh, 20 plus years um, and, and trying to sort of fulfill my role at the service course at the same time. So it's a, it's a busy period. Excellent. And, and still riding your bike a bit. We understand that a couple of days ago you did the Melbourne to Warrnambool, which is not exactly a, a short ride to throw yourself into. No, that's right. And so since I, I, I stepped away from, from professional racing, I don't think I'd ridden my bike over four hours. Um, and I could probably count on one hand how many times I'd ridden in excess of 100 kilometres. Um, and I got approached about uh, joining a group of guys that were celebrating 125 years of the Melbourne to Warrnambool. Um, and they were uh, doing a 336 kilometer ride um, on Monday. Uh, and I got a week's notice. So I did one long ride on the, on the Thursday beforehand uh, where I did a six hour ride and I got through that okay. So I thought, hey, what the heck? Um, I'll line up for, for 330 odd Ks. It took us about 10 hours and needless to say, I'm still recovering. <laughs> <Excellent>. <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, Simon, as my background is in starting of helping starting writers, when we look at your resume, so to speak, we see Ringerike as the first team you were on. And then my question comes, wow, that champion must have had a lot of winner's mindset already when he was 18 to race for a Ringerike team that most probably, with all respect for the team, Nobody knew. Can you can you explain how you got there and and why? Um, yeah, well, Team Ringerdick. It wasn't my uh, my first team in, in Europe. I moved to Europe when I was nineteen, um, okay. and my first team was an Italian under twenty three team uh, where I was placed on an associate Australian Institute of Sports scholarship um, to get some experience abroad. So I raced. Uh, my first year abroad was in the year two thousand, uh, where I was racing in a small Italian club team. Following that, I, I raced with the Australian national team, which were based also in Italy um, for a couple of years. And then as I left the under-23 ranks, it wasn't, a, well, it never feels like it's a good time to be, to be trying to break into the pro peloton. But at that point in time, there was a huge, there was a couple of teams fold, um, a lot of guys on the market, and I, I didn't have the results to justify a professional contract. Um, I was offered an opportunity with this Norwegian team. Um, the year previous, it was called Team Crone. Uh, they were doing quite an international racing program. So I thought, hey, that could be a good, a good stepping stone to get some experience in some lower level professional racing um, and hopefully use that as a platform to, to go into bigger and better things. Unfortunately, uh, the team lost their title sponsor at the very beginning of the year. So it really dropped back in budget. Uh, we ended up racing quite a lot on amateur races, quite a lot in Scandinavia. Um, so I didn't really get the exposure that I was looking for in that year, but it was still a, a big learning experience. It was great to sort of race into other countries, integrate with a, my first really, um, yeah, international sort of low level professional team. Um, the next year after that, I went back to the amateur ranks and, and competed in France in, in that was in 2004 by this point. Uh, and it was actually racing amateur in France. I really found my niche. Um, I managed to win a bunch of races uh, got noticed and and turned professional with AGR, AG2R the following year. Yeah, and yeah, so we I, spoke. Um, we spoke uh, recently with Matt Heyman, who similarly to you, he came over as a very young guy to Europe, and yeah, you know, Matt talked actually about you know the joy of racing, the whole adventure, but he also talked a lot about the loneliness and the solitude. I mean, how how did you find those early years of you know being out here trying to to get some breaks, trying to make it, but ultimately being on your own in a different culture, maybe not speaking the language. 
Um, well, my first uh, year abroad was probably quite tough. I, I, I got on the aeroplane. I didn't speak uh, a lick of Italian. I, I was just, for me, it was just a big adventure. I didn't really know what I was getting into. I just knew I had to get on this aeroplane and someone was going to meet me at the other end to, to pick me up and take me to where I was going to be living. Um, so, yeah, that first year was tough. The next couple of years, I was with a group of Australians um, and had some great mates in the team. There was a really good camaraderie within the team. It was tough, don't get me wrong. We were all jammed in one team house. Our equipment was pretty lousy and we were getting belted week in, week out by a, a really high level of amateur racing uh, in Italy at the time. Um, so there were difficult periods. Um, you know, I was probably a little bit homesick on the odd occasion those first couple of years, but I just learned to embrace it. I tried to pick up the language as quick as I could and it just became home uh, being away and I just sort of got used to, to being away. Um, and then, you know, next thing I know, it's been 21 years uh, since I was outside of Australia um, uh, permanently and, and I only just moved back. So there were difficult periods through that, through that point in time, don't get me wrong, um, but I was really following my passion. Um, I, I, I love the competition. I love the, the training. Um, I love the culture of being uh, European-based. Um, so I didn't really feel like it, I was really sacrificing anything. Could you... Could you give us an example of how you could overcome self-doubt issues or homesickness at some points? Can you, can you, because it's easy to say I, I overcame it, but can you give an example? Because that's more tangible for a lot of people. Um, well, I guess the homesickness type issues, I just tried to create home elsewhere. You know, obviously you can't replace your family and things like that, but you can definitely try and build a, a new network of friends. Uh, like I said, I, was, I really tried to learn the languages as quick as I could so I could have local friends and, and understand what was going on locally. So I just really tried to create a new life for myself uh, in Europe. Um, with regards to, you know, what else I was doing to, to overcome that sort of thing and how I sort of, you know, got through that environment, I just just got wholeheartedly into into my racing it was what my whole reason death was about that was my entire life was to be there um and i had you know, always had ambitions to get to the next level in my in my racing career and i knew how, and, and i knew that's where i had to be to do that yeah mm -hmm. i mean people that we've um we've met over the years who've worked with you simon you know have always talked about your work ethic the, the, that of, of all the pros that they've interacted with over the years you were the you were one of those with the strongest work ethic um, you know, sometimes people will say that, you know, when talent doesn't work hard, hard work beats talent. I mean, what, what's your view on this balance between natural ability and work ethic and, and how you find some sort of, you know, ground there? Um, yeah, you know, that's a great saying when, when, you know, about, you know, the work ethic and, and, and the talent itself. But I always said, you know, Time and time again, you kind of hear of people saying, oh, there's this guy, he's super talented, he's coming through, he's doing this and doing that. And my response is, is always, well, talent comes in many ways, shapes and form. You know, just because you've got a brilliant VO2 max or just because you can ride a certain power to weight mate ratio doesn't mean you have the, um, the resilience to survive uh, overseas and away from your family and friends or to know how to look after yourself with nutrition and know how to recover and do all those sort of bits and pieces. Um, and I think to be a, a good professional, you need a combination of all of those things. And you can definitely be stronger in certain areas than, than others, but you definitely need to be very complete in your approach. And sort of for myself, I never saw myself as the most gifted athlete. I was, there, was, there was always many, many stronger guys around or many guys that, were, that I saw were physically uh, more gifted than myself. Um, but I just made sure, made a real point throughout my entire career of making the best of what I had. And I, I really tried to make sure I left no stone unturned and I did everything I could in every scenario to sort of get the best out of myself. Is there something particular you did because you said, I wanted to give the best of myself, but again, how did you know what was the best? Is there a particular thing you did to find out what was the best for you? Uh, no, I don't think there was one particular thing. And, um, and, and as you sort of look through the teams that I've been racing with, one of the, the teams that I was uh, a part of for a couple of years was Team Sky. And one of uh, Dave Brailsford, the team principal at Team Sky and, and now Team Ineos, his um, favourite sayings, and I thought this is, this is great. He's saying, we don't do one thing 100% better than anybody else. We do 100 things 1% better. You know, so it's not about just saying 
I'm better at this one thing than, than everybody, or I'm doing this one thing that nobody else is doing. It's addressing every touch point uh, of your life and your cycling career to make sure that you are getting the best out of every area. And I even think back to my last year amateur when I was sort of, you know, 23, 24 years of age, I was sort of basically living on my own in a flat in France, um, moved to a town where I really knew nobody, had some teammates that weren't too far away that I used to um, hook up with for, for training rides. And I remember sitting back in the afternoons after training and I'd sit there with a notepad and pen and just write down, okay, this is what I'm doing. What else can I be doing here? How else can I improve that? Whether it was my, my no diet, my stretching, my training, my equipment, whatever I could do. And I remember just making notes and then I would call people and talk to them and have different sort of mentors um, that were a part of my career uh, from the beginning. And I'll talk to them about these things and say, hey, I'm doing this ergo session, uh, but I was thinking about changing the efforts in this way or I was thinking about doing this sort of thing in recovery. What do you think? Um, and I just really try and absorb as much information as I could from everybody around me um, to really help myself get the, to get the best out of every point in my, in my life to become a better bike rider. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great what you're saying, because I guess what you're talking about here is the link between, you know, there's one thing to have self-belief. There's another thing to have the belief that you're on the line, having done every piece of work that you can to actually deliver the result, which I think what, what you're talking about is all of those, all those things you're doing. Um, but at the same time, you mentioned earlier that you, 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 you had that love for riding your bike. And, and so again, and it's interesting you mentioned Dave Brailsford because he was on a, an interview recently where, with Dan Jones on the Detour podcast. And he talked about how in, in Sky and Ineos, how perhaps they'd lost the, how did he put it? He, they lost the appreciation for how important fun and joy was for the riders and that he was seeing now a need to bring that back a little bit, bring back more of the fun and excitement and joy of just the pleasure of doing crazy things in races, you know. What's your take on that? You know, how do you balance this seriousness of the winner's mentality with the joy and enjoyment for the sport? Well, I think that, that when you're a, a professional cyclist, there's nothing more fun than actually winning. And I guess in reflection, you kind of look at Team Ineos this year and the, and the season wasn't successful as what it has been in years gone by. So I guess that's where he's probably feel like that organisation is probably starting to feel the weight of, of not winning and not being that dominant force. So they need to look to other ways to actually really try and lift the mood of the group. So it's good that he's thinking about other ways that he can address this when they're not winning to go, okay, we may be not be getting the enjoyment out of winning bike races, but we still need to love riding our bikes. What can we, what else can we be doing? Um, and when they were out of contention in, in, in the general classification, what they're normally targeting in races, it was great to see those guys on the attack and really lighting the race up and, and racing like um, they had nothing to lose. Um, so I think that's what they were really trying to do to, to bring back a bit of spark back into that team. So related to that one, I, I think, Simon, is this, which is, I um, mean, if I reflect back to seeing you in the final kilometres of many races, you know, whether it was Liège or whether it was Milan San Remo, um, you've talked about the physical preparation of getting to the line and having that belief that although not being the strongest guy, you could still beat those who are stronger than you. Maybe you could say what's per kilo kind of cancel our kind of guys. What about psychologically? No, I never really worked with a psychologist or anything like that um, throughout my career. I did, there were certain teams that had sort of people around and again, it was team sky that had a, a psychologist there. So I did do a couple of sessions with him, but I definitely didn't have someone that I would turn to or, or would visit uh, regularly throughout my career. I never had somebody consistently. Um, but um, I guess the way I always race these, these races is I always saw that, you know, I had one shot at, at winning them and, and I basically had to gamble everything on that one chance. I wasn't a kind of guy that could follow every attack uh, and then still win or, you know, or sort of just, you know, play a number of cards. I basically had one card to play and I backed myself with that. And on a number of occasions it, it, it paid off and it paid off big and a number of occasions I missed out as well. That was, that was sort of how it, how it unfolds. So um, yeah, psychologically, I just really tried to focus on the card I had to play or my tactic that I was going to uh, unfold on the day and, and, and back that hundred um, percent. And like I said, every now and then it plays off and it plays off really big, but you know, I had a couple of big second places throughout my career as well. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And just finally on that winner's mindset, um, 
again, I, I recall seeing you in, I think, Liège the year after you'd, you'd won. And, and I think you crashed out that, that following year. And just I remember seeing you, you know, on the TV, sitting beside the road with this complete look of kind of dejection on your face or disappointment or whatever it was. I mean, how do you as an individual, you know, pick yourself up, you know, because you, you've had crashes, you've had broken bones, you've had these setbacks, second places. I mean, how do you keep that resilience to, to just keep, keep going when you are knocked down in that way? Uh, for me, the key to that is just goal setting. It's really plain and simple. I was always a very goal oriented person. So whether it was I had a setback through injury or whether I missed an objective or whether a race didn't sort of unfold how I wanted to um, or, you know, I didn't come up to the right condition that I was hoping to for, for a goal. Um, for me, it was just about setting new objectives. And yep. as long as I had something to work towards, um, I could put a plan in place and then I had a new focus again. Um, for me, the most difficult points throughout my racing career was always after, say, for example, I crashed out of a race and I was on the way to the hospital or something like that and I didn't know the extent of my injuries mm. because that was that small window of time there where I was just in an unknown period and I didn't know what I was going to be able to aim for. I couldn't set a new goal. Once I had that first diagnosis from a doctor to say, okay, you've done this to yourself, this is going to time frame you're going to be on the sidelines for. At this point in time, you're going to be able to start training again. It's like, okay, if that's the case, I've had this long off, I'll be able to train. There's my new goal. That's what I'm working towards. And from then, I was fine. So for me, dealing with adversity or dealing with setbacks um, was all about goal setting. And, and that was a big thing that I really tried to have in place the whole time. And whenever I was, you know, goalless, uh, I was basically rudderless. I was kind of lost. Um, so that's something I'm sure we'll get into a little bit later in that chat, but that's sort of something I, I tried to continue really um, in my career after racing as well. Okay, great. Hey, so Bernard, why don't we jump now onto the topic of culture, okay, yeah. like winning culture, and then we'll come to life after pro. So yeah, no I'm worries. Sure you've got some no worries. Go culture, ahead. Bernard. Yeah. Oh, um, you you mentioned already the the team Sky. Um, can you compare? like the winning culture in the teams can you can you give us one example of one thing that you thought was very great in one team as a winner's culture or a winner's mentality as a team not as an individual but as a team well i think the the, the most successful teams have that that winning culture within the team it's never so much just about an individual with a winning mindset it's about the team really rallying behind a certain a certain team leader um, or supporting one another to 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 win the race or or to get the best result possible um, so for me that's what it's all about it's all about having a team buy into the to the success and having everybody Within the, within the team, within the organization, um, commit to the objective. Um, and that's what creates a winning culture because all of a sudden, you know, whatever the result, everybody feels like they've contributed to that result. Um, and that's, that's a real winning culture. Um, and I've been a part of teams that have done that outstandingly well. And I've been a part of teams, which is the same organization that have got that drastically wrong as well. Um, when you know not everybody is rowing the boat the same direction um, as a as a as a metaphor, um, and in that environment, no one wants to be in there. It's it's toxic. It's it's um, you know it, it's it's just basically not conducive to performing well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Simon, the um, we had had conversations with many pros, you know, who've been who've talked about the old world versus the new world cultures. You know, when they say the old world cultures, they talk about hierarchy where the DSs are basically directive, the riders are there to, be, to, to do what they're told. And then you have other teams which have a much less hierarchical, much more inclusive and open kind of dialogue, whether it's you know, pre-race or even, even during the race. What, what, what was your experience there throughout your career and was there a better way in, in your view? Um, <clears throat> there is, I think a hierarchy is important. You know, at the end of the day, the buck's got to start with somebody and somebody's got to put their hand up to lead the team and, and to win the race. So there's always an, a hierarchy um, when it comes to who's doing what where to get the result at the end of the day and who's calling the shots. But I think that hierarchy or that order of, of decision-making or of contribution needs to be pre-agreed and, and, and basically signed off on by everybody, all the stakeholders involved. Um, 
and whether that's a culture where collectively you decide what you're going to do in the race, whether that's one person saying, guys, this is the tactic today. Um, I think that's kind of irrelevant. What the most important thing is, is everybody's prepared to buy into that. And I've been a part of teams where you sit down, it's a basically big open forum, collectively you decide how you're going to go about trying to, trying to win the race. And that's worked on occasions every now and then, obviously, on, but more often than not, you know, that doesn't work. And then you have someone that says, right, guys, this is the tactic for today. Um, I've decided and this is, this is how it's going to work. And again, sometimes that goes wrong and sometimes that goes right as well. So um, it's not sort of much, so much about the culture of how that decision is made. It's the culture of whether that decision has been bought into by everybody. Okay. That's, that's a great one because I think that was in a lot of teams, the difference between having a successful year and, and not a successful year. Uh, would there be one, one example where you would say after some sort of a, a plan that didn't work, what was a very inspiring thing move that was made by one of the riders or one of the DSs? to get it all going again the next day. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the, the last Tour de France I competed in. Um, I lined up there with the BMC racing team. Uh, the objective of the Tour de France was to win with Richie Port. You know, that's what we're all there for. That's what we all bought into. Um, and, you know, after you know the, the ninth stage in the Tour de France, which was at that point, Richie's kind of a bad omen, um, it all went pear-shaped, but we had a sensational Greg Van Avema in the team who just stepped up to the plate in true leadership form and, and really carried the team through the Tour de France. He raced above and beyond all expectation, had the yellow jersey for a long period of time. The day he looked like losing it, he extended it, that sort of thing. So I think um, having uh, a plan B as a fallback plan, um, I always say you never go in with two plan A's. You can always go in with a plan A and a plan B, but having a plan B with a dynamic leader that has the ability to step up and, and, and carry the organization is, is, is very, very important. So um, in that scenario, racing with the BMC racing team in the Tour de France in 2018. Yeah, but it, it's typical what you told earlier, the discipline and the consistency in your preparation to race. To me, it feels like you were doing that also for how you were living and how you would live next year. Is, is because you, you talk as is, as if it is natural, but when you look around in the peloton, is it that natural that everybody really looks the way you look? Do you understand what I'm saying? Meaning preparing for pretty much life, although you're racing and on a lot of pressure? Yeah, but I think you can look at, I was always, you know, taking a long-term view on most things that I was doing and I was always thinking about what I was going to do when I was done racing. Um, you learn very early on in the piece that you, you have a shelf life as a professional cyclist or professional athlete. At some day it's going to stop and, you, and you're still a very young person with a lot of life to live after that. And, you know, in cycling, there are very, very few people that exit the sport um, that are financially secure enough, you know, if they choose to not to do anything else. Um, I was always a very active person. I don't sit still very well. So I knew in myself, regardless of my financial situation, that I was going to need some projects and going to need some things, uh, some goals to work towards. So I was always really careful to make sure that I had plenty to look forward to after my career. I think um, a lot of uh, athletes, not just cyclists, athletes in general, um, probably um, overvalue their worth uh, to a certain extent and think that because they've been a successful athlete that the red carpet is going to continue to be laid out for them when they finished uh, their competitive careers, which isn't the case. You're very quickly yesterday's news. So um, I think it's very important to have a, a good plan for what you're going to do afterwards. But in saying that, like I was very strategic, but potentially in the last couple of years, that may have become a bit of a distraction to me as well because I was thinking so much about, hey, what comes next? Because that, that day is coming soon. And then the here and now and really trying to get the best out of my, my racing. Yeah, it's interesting you say that, Simon, because I think that's a, <laughs> that is a, a dilemma that we, we've spoken with many 
current and former professionals about this fear that you know thinking too hard about what comes after the career will distract them from the here and now so that's one we'd love to explore further and we'll be talking with with more pros about um you did make a pretty dramatic shift i mean you you finished your pro career and you went pretty pretty much straight into a, a trading role um with goldman sachs in london why did you decide on that path and ultimately you decided eventually that i understand it wasn't going to be the long-term path for you yeah, so I didn't go directly into a trading role. I actually um, put my hand, I, I started a, an internship um, yeah. at the bank at Goldman Sachs in London in, in the securities division. And I had a number of mentors throughout my career sort of helping me with, you know, some investment advice and some career advice and some activities to do away from racing. Um, and I was talking to a number of different people about, you know, what path I should take when I was finishing, finishing up uh, racing. Um, whether it was to do some study or whether it was, you know, to try and work with a certain business or to stay involved in cycling or go down a, a route with the media. Um, and through that process, one thing I discovered was, you know, uh, banking was a, a, an area where many, many successful people that I've been associated with had experience. And yeah. off the back of that, I started to look into what opportunities there, there would be in banking. And, I, and that's where I come across the, the internship program that they have at Goldman Sachs. So through a number of people, I managed to get an email contact with the person that I found out was, was running that program. I reached out to them, sent them some emails, managed to have a phone conversation with them. Um, and they said, yeah, well, this is, the, this is a, actually a program that we ran um, up until about you know, 2012 or 13, but it's no longer really in existence. And I said, you know, well, I'm interested in it. Is there any way that we could, you could, you could look at, at me for this program? And they said, well, actually, we, we haven't had anyone of your caliber in sport really apply for the program. So why don't you come over for an interview? Mm -hmm. um, so that was one of, I think, 23 or four interviews um, that I went through with the bank. And that's, and I found out retrospectively, that's, you know, famously a Goldman Sachs way. They really interview everybody. You have to get sign off from a lot of people before they take anybody, accept anybody into their, into their, um, into the bank, basically, whether it's for an internship or an employee employment or anything like that. So I went over, I did a, a huge number of interviews, basically over a two year period. Whenever I had a few days off, off racing or a block where I was having a bit of downtime, I was on a plane to London to go over and do some interviews. And so I basically, um, managed to get sign off um, and they accepted me um, as an intern um, initially for the 2018. Right. Um, and then I got an opportunity to, to race for one more year um, at BMC um, on, on sort of within interesting goal. Um, and fortunately I was able to postpone my internship by one more year. And, and I started it in, in 2019. So I had that, I had that sort of, I was planning that for quite some time before I actually stepped away for the sport. And when I was stepping away from cycling, I had a lot of people say, well, why not one more year? And I just yeah. said, I just did one more year. I had to, I'd made my mind up sort of 12 months ago. Um, which, this which, is what I want to do now. Which and wasn't just, I mean, they, they, I mean, you were able to end your career on your own terms, which also is, is you know, not the case for many, many riders. But, but how did that feel, Simon? I mean, going into an organisation almost as a rookie again. I mean, in your mid-30s, I mean, you've got this incredible experience and you know, uh, recognition, if you like, and then going in almost as a, at the bottom of the ladder. What, what was that experience like? I was actually craving that. I was actually looking, looking to start from the beginning uh, somewhere all over again. Um, for coming over, there's always this, where for so many years, a lot of part of my career, you were at the absolute top end and the expectation was, was always so high with everywhere. I was just actually really looking forward to just rolling up my sleeves, starting from scratch and learning a new trade. And and I was able to do that in an environment where I was surrounded by some of the smartest people you find anywhere and some of the most successful people you find anywhere. So um, I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed sort of my internship, which I did sort of over about a five month period uh, before they offered me a, a permanent position in the bank um, and how it unfolded. Basically, I was offered this position in, in a foreign exchange sort of uh, sales team um, at the time my gut feeling was this is not quite the right fit for me. Um, it was, it was very, uh, it was very tech heavy. Um, it wasn't very relationship based. It was very, very transactional. And I thought this is not the right opportunity, but Hey, it's not every day they're offering out jobs at, at Goldman Sachs. So I should take it, see what I can make of it. 
you know, I might, uh, I might sort of grow into the role. Um, but I found after being there for a period of time, it wasn't quite right. And it was a huge sacrifice for both myself uh, and my family. The fact that I was out the door most days at about 5 a.m., not home to sort of 7 p.m. at night, day in, day out. Um, after so many years of, of racing and training really hard, I can, I can say hand on heart, I've never been as tired as what I was when I was working at, at, at Goldman Sachs. So um, I really had to push myself. Um, I got so far out of my comfort zone. I had to, I was studying for the first time in, in 20 plus years ago and I had to pass all the regulatory exams. So that was just pushing myself in, 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 in completely different ways. Um, but at the end, you know, it resulted in, a, and I got a job, uh, which was the first goal. It's like, okay, do this internship, learn as much as you can and try and get a job at the end of it, which I achieved. Once I was in that role, I kind of thought, okay, this is not the right role for me. This is not a long-term play. I don't think it's sustainable. Um, so I should open my eyes for what other opportunities are, are out there. And that's what directed me towards a service course. Oh, it's, it's uh, wonderful how many times you say I follow my gut feeling because, you know, let's face it, being a, a very successful uh, cyclist and then getting a job at Goldman Sachs, which is a big name, and you're surrounded by big people still going to feel to where your gut wants you to go looks like very courageous and uh the moment you said it you can just see the smile on your face so the enjoyment must be real big in what you're doing today is that right yeah most definitely and it, it sort of only occurred to me around the middle of this year that i know no other entry point by the tape bend you know, I, I got out of professional sport and I was in sort of probably one of the most elite investment banks there are in the world. Um, I step out of that into an executive role of, a, of basically a startup business where I'm just learning the whole time. Things are just coming at you left, right and centre um, and every, every now and then from behind that you don't even see coming. Um, and, you know, the next experience, you know, this year uh, was my first experience in, in commentary and it was, you know, live at the Tour de France. Uh, really so I've done a few snippets here and down then it's like and it, it was at that point it occurred to me it's it's like I always end up just diving straight in the deep end there's never just oh I'll just <laughs> test test the water here and see if I like it it's bam straight in 100 percent yeah it's interesting what you say this Simon also as we hear you talk about the Goldman's experience and reflecting on that how what it sounds to me like you know like you you, you were such a competitor you, you you were always wanting to be on the top step of the podium win the biggest races and from a career perspective, you can't get much more ambitious than a job at Goldman Sachs, right? So you, you clearly you were setting your goal high based upon your, your vision as a winner. However, then you started to talk about what you started to understand as your talents. You know, you, you mentioned relationships being important to you. Um, you mentioned family, you know, and integrating that as, as part of your wider career as being important to you. I mean, how, how has your thinking now evolved around what, you know, what, what are Simon Guerin's talents beyond being a talented bike rider? What, what are you really good at? What are your strengths? If, if I was to ask somebody, what is Simon awesome at besides riding a bike? What would they say? Um, I see always sort of found that my strengths are, you know, we've talked about work ethic and committing and being consistent, uh, which are a big key, I think, to success in, in any sport or industry. Um, but I think, um, I'm good at building a culture and motivating people to get the best out of themselves. And I think I can, I can build an environment with, with the team that I'm working with um, where everybody is, is motivated to succeed. And I think what I've found over the years, it's, it's finding what motivates people and how to motivate people to not only get the best out of themselves, but, for them to contribute to getting the best out of the the goal of the of the team or the organization, um, so that's sort of what I feel like is is one of my strengths, and I kind of feel like I'm I'm not the the alpha male in the room. I don't have to be the one that has to be that is the center of attention, um, but I kind of feel like that. Um, I have the ability, when required, to sort of step up, step up and lead a team or an organization um, and try and get the best out of people. That is very inspiring. I think uh, I think more people should really look the way you look at it, uh, because 
you say you feel that. Can you can you give us an example of how how you feel it? Meaning, like, is there an example, uh, for example, that uh, you can't wait to get to the people again the next day? Is there something tangible that you really feel like, oh yes, this is really signals from within me that I need to do this? Hmm. Yeah, well, and, and and actually, you know, it's one thing that I'm probably finding a bit of a challenge at the moment is is working remotely and um, having the virtual contact with people for for a few hours each day uh, while I'm overlapped with the, with the European uh, and uh, the European time frame uh, from here in Australia is probably one of the challenges I'm going at the moment because, um, like we've talked about, I feel like I am a a relationship type person and I can and I can sort of bring the best out of people when I'm in the environment with them so one thing I'm going to have to a little adapt in, in my approach and, and learn how to uh, go about things a little bit differently is um, the, to, to learn how to do that um, through a different means but um, I kind of feel like uh, throughout my my racing career um, one thing that I was able to do is um, basically when I put my hand up to lead a team, you know, I was able to step up and, and get the best, best result that I could on that day. And another thing that I was, I've sort of found that later in my career, I was a guy that was sort of often called upon to help be the road captain at a race is to also get the best out of a team. Even when I wasn't the guy that had to deliver the result is that I kind of had the ability to get the best out of everybody in that environment. Um, and I quickly found myself in, 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 a, in a new career um, outside of the sport in a kind of a leadership position again, because I think, I think, again, I can sort of get a group of people together and really get everybody to buy into the, to the, to the goal of the organization. So, yeah, I sort of, it's, it's not something that uh, it feels like it's one of those things that I just keep getting pushed into that or, or finding myself in that position to be able to do that. Um, whether I'm actively, actively seeking that or not. Yep. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned, Simon, as well, I mean, your, your experience at Goldman and I'm sure the experience now, which is uh, you're on a new path and that also involves learning, right? Um, mm -hmm. As an athlete, you know, when you were competing for Liège or Milan San Remo, you know, you knew the distance of the race. You knew how many altitude meters there were. So in a way, you could break that down mm -hmm. to very, very specific training protocols and, and efforts and all the stuff around it, the nutrition and the weight loss and everything. So in a way, there was perhaps more of a formula there. How have you grappled with that moving into life beyond the peloton? Because actually there's much more, in a way, complexity, ambiguity around how we achieve success in, say, the service course as a business than you mm. would in training for a race. So, so how do you know what you should be learning? How do you know, you know where you should be channeling your energy in this much more complex kind of setting now? Well, I think the learning is a very important element of it. And one thing that I was always adamant of that whatever I did after racing, I wanted to be in a career where I was going to be developing as, as, as a person and professionally. The last thing I wanted to do was find myself in a role where I was just regurgitating what I already knew. Um, I would found I would probably get very bored in that position very quickly. Um, so I always wanted to be developing, you know, professionally. And, and I think that's why, that's why I was drawn to Goldman Sachs because I could see there was such a huge scope of development that I could go through within that organization. Um, so I guess sort of going back to your question is, for me, that has probably been one thing that I've always been drawn to and the success of it. I think success is measured in, in different ways by different people. And you have to have a strong understanding of what success means to you and everything else should just basically be white noise because what you see as being a success may be way higher than what someone else sees as a successful result and may be way lower than what somebody else sees as a successful result. But, it's, but ultimately, I think when you come from uh, of a career in professional sport, um, you do set the standard, your, your standards pretty high. That's, we're both silent. <laughs> <laughs> no, I guess that there, there's an aspect of that though, Simon, because, yeah. um, you know, I also saw many videos where you were not alone at races. Your wife, Rihanna, was also there. 
Mm. So can you talk about this a little bit in terms of not just the journey as a pro, but also the journey in making the transition post-professional cycling career and how your role, your wife has played a role in that? Oh, yeah, my wife, Rana, she's played a, a massive role. You know, she's my biggest supporter throughout. And, you know, I wouldn't have achieved the, the accomplishments I achieved uh, at a sporting level um, without her, her support. Um, she she's been completely bought in into my career. Um, and, you know, she's still, she still really steers the ship at home now. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it is very important that everybody in your sort of circle, and I think it's important to keep that circle pretty tight, um, is on board with, with what you're trying to achieve. Because as soon as you have sort of one person there that's doubting or that's trying to pull you in a direction away from that, um, that can make life very difficult and become a big distraction. So, um, you know, my home life has been been very important and and and, and a huge part of, of um, my successes. Yeah. But and you did allude to work life balance with regard to the London job. Um, to what extent was that sort of a realization that you know obviously because there is a tension, right? Because as a winner, you want to be the best and and you want to be you know achieving, you want to be recognized, but often that also comes with a sacrifice. So, you know, now that you're in your or beyond your mid thirties, you know, how do you reflect upon and how do you achieve a more balanced view of success when you have, you have three young children, one on the way, do you have a tendency to overwork? I do. And I probably never, I probably, that's a, a balance is probably a, a nice balance is probably something that I've never found um, because, you know, I'm probably a bit of a workaholic when it comes to it. Um, but like I said, I'm really, really fortunate that I have a supportive family uh, and they and they know what I'm like. Um, but one thing I tried to do that when I'm in this space with with my family, I'm wholeheartedly in that space. You know, I try not to be distracted by by work stuff. I might disappear for a month at a time to go and work, but when I'm at home for a weekend or when I'm doing something with the kids, I'm really trying to be uh, 100% in that space. Um, yeah, I, I knew the the balance wasn't quite right when I was at Goldman's, and you know, I, I'd rush home at the end of the day, be catching the tube or public transport, and you get home. And, you know, you sit on the couch for the kids to read you a story. And, and I was asleep but by the time that I was sort of one page in because I was just so physically exhausted. And that's when I kind of realised that this is, this is not the life that I want right now. I, I do want to be more present uh, for my kids when I am at home. Oh, well, that means that there is quite a difference between the, the Simon that flew to Europe for the first time 22 years ago and the Simon that flew back to Australia to settle there now, like a few months ago, as you were saying, um, yeah. if you need to tell to people three main differences for yourself, obviously you got married and you have a family, but in your mind, what are three main differences that you came across that you would have never thought about coming over yeah. to, to Europe to race your bike? I guess one of the big main differences, I went over with one suitcase, you know, as a 19 year old, and I came back 20 years later with two shipping containers worth of stuff, <laughs> uh, uh, a wife and three kids. So um, I did accumulate quite a big life abroad, but I guess, you know, the experiences and, and the friendships that I built over in Europe, like I said, I went over there, I didn't speak a, uh, a word of Italian, um, I knew nobody really, a, a couple of Aussies that I knew that were scattered out around Europe um, racing their bikes. Now I could say that I have, you know, friends in like good friends in most countries within Europe. So um, it's the people you meet throughout the processes, throughout that 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 life that you build abroad that um, are so important. Um, and I guess it's the life experiences. You know, you you sort of evolve so much of a person. You like I had ha over half of my life uh, on the other side of the world from from the area that I grew up. I grew up in a small country, like farming community. Um, and then to sort of end up living in some of the biggest cities and uh, most well-known places in the world, um, as well as to sort of competing at the highest level on the world stage. Um, it's a heck of a long journey. Excellent. Okay, Simon Gerrans, thank you very much for this insightful, open and, and very honest interview. Um, for those of you who've been watching, if you have enjoyed the discussion, please do give us the thumbs up. And of course, please do subscribe to the This Cycling Life YouTube channel. So Bernard Muderman, Simon Gerrans, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Simon. Enjoyed the chat. Thank you.